trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Welcome to episode 93 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris, and this is Chris. Hi. This time we read The Tuttle Twins and the Fate of the Future by Connor Boyack. We decided to read this after Paris was served an ad for this book series on Facebook many months ago. This is a 60-page children's book with illustrations that is a retelling of Murray Rothbard's Anatomy of the State. Uh, This was published in 2018 and was illustrated by Elijah Stanfield. If this is the first time you are listening to Terrible Book Club, what we do here is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of those three. Sometimes we even read books that our patrons recommend. In general, though, we do the opposite of what most people do when they are browsing in a bookstore or looking through Amazon. We read things that we wouldn't want to read. Usually this experiment results in a disappointing read, but once in a while we end up liking the book. I don't think that happened today. Um, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Well, uh, hey, it's anarcho-capitalism for kids. Yeah, anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism for kids. (laughs) Oh boy, Uh, it's content warnings today. Yeah, let's just get this out of the way. Our our usual barnyard language plus uh, political discussion. So this is all. This is going to be political philosophy one hundred and one with terrible book club. Um, More like for me, it's going to feel like probably remedial political philosophy. To be (laughs) honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, uh, I haven't studied social and political philosophy in like a decade so i'm pretty rusty but uh you know here we here we are um yeah so obviously it's impossible to discuss this book without discussing politics and we are going to end up talking about the current state of the u.s so if um if that's a little hard right now we do not blame you uh you you should skip this one if you're not interested in hearing anything political we've got we've got a whole back catalog of stuff that isn't so you know head head backward in time like we all wish we yeah. could <laughs> Just take a break i listened to like a very old episode of a podcast today and then i realized it was the one directly after the 2016 election and i was like fuck i just oh. made it worse <laughs> Do you remember when we came back from our hiatus and yeah. our first episode was like right after um What's the day there? <laughs> Election day? No, no, it was uh the swearing in day, the the day inauguration. Of- yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> The the day where President Man be, be, is not another man. Yes, it's it's the it's other man day. I couldn't think of the word inauguration. I'm really tired today, everyone. I'm real sorry. Um, oh, Paris, wait is that is, is that all the content warnings? Yeah, it's just it's a kids wait. book. There's nothing. Oh, so we're free then. The curse has ended. Oh my god, we're free, we're free. Oh my god, there's no sexual assault. There's nothing. Oh, thank god. Oh, I just realized that we didn't want to talk about that today. Yeah. Oh, how wonderful. Maybe we should stay in children's literature for a while and hopefully not encounter the dark specter that seems to infest (laughs) every book that we read. Oh, that's a great plan. Although, there there is one other minor content warning i guess for this one thing in the book that's like borderline not cool racist stuff uh but it's it's just one moment so hopefully that that's not too much of a thing but yeah wow we do not have to talk about sexual assault today yeah Whew. so let's move on from that and not say those words again in this yeah. episode <laughs> <laughs> all right so um hmm, this is the summary for the tuttle twins and the fate of the future <clears throat> Should we coerce others to get what we want? 
The history of the world is a tale of some people bossing others around, but brave thinkers have always offered ideas for a better future where people use persuasion instead. And after Ethan and Emily watch a dystopian film portraying a future full of coercion, they realize that they need to learn how to avoid it. Enter Murray Rothbard, author of Anatomy of the State, whose book teaches the Tuttle Twins that the fate of the future, and all of humanity, depends on thinking of ways we can work together peacefully to build a better society without relying on coercion. Okay, so have you ever been asked to do something you don't want? Because fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. <laughs> Tuttle Twins refuse. Um. Yeah, so our... Our characters and setting. I actually, there's no setting. Uh, it's kind of like generic white American suburb is kind of what it looks like. Um, well, the very first scene is multicultural, so perhaps. <laughs> it's a white American <laughs> suburb, Chris. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Tuttle, Ethan and Emily, the eponymous Tuttle twins, and then their neighbor, Fred, who I feel like is just fred rogers like mr rogers he's just yeah. a, stand, a stand-in um for that really <laughs> just a nice guy that you, the kids go to and he has like philosophy books for them to check out he's got a whole library so um let's let's just once again let's do uh let's do a nice succinct summary so people know what this book is again this is a chill 60 page children's book with illustrations so it's not like there's a whole lot <laughs> yeah. going on but thank uh, god we, we've gone to the complete opposite end of the spectrum now <laughs> Got I know. sick of pages and words. Well, it is. I mean, we have to kind of layer books like this. Otherwise, reading 600 page books every week is just it's it's a lot, um, mm-hmm. especially when you have other reading and, oh, I don't know, a life other than this podcast yeah. <laughs> like we both do. Um, so, yeah. So sometimes we read kids books and hey, like this one, this one we chose today. I think we're going to get a pretty good discussion out of it. So. Mm-hmm. All right. So the summary for this book. Um, it starts off with like a, a multicultural community neighborhood book club hosted at Fred's slash house. Slash potluck? Yeah, slash potluck. And it's hosted at their neighbor Fred's house. And each kid is holding a book about their country of origin or ancestral heritage. And I, I don't know, this is kind of maybe kind of a weird book club because like, does, isn't a book club usually, hey, we all read the same book and then we talk about it? But I guess Wait, in this book Paris, club... we could have been reading different books this whole time. <laughs> Imagine how much ground we could have covered by now. Yeah, I, so I, I don't know if maybe it was like, oh, each kid read a book about their ancestral heritage or country of origin and then presented it to the group that that's kind of so what i it's a book report club is yes what it's a me. book report club i mean that's what i gathered and there's also an amish kid in there which i i had questions about but i forgot to even I, look into that i think that's fine that like they they don't complete I don't, I don't know. You know what? I, I don't, don't know. Chris, I don't think an Amish child would be allowed to go to like a regular ass book club in the suburbs. All right. Yeah, Amish, yeah I don't know. I was going to say know. Amish <laughs> listeners. Yeah, there are no Amish <laughs> listeners to this. Yeah, if you're getting your terrible book club <laughs> on wax fucking cylinders. <laughs> Imagine how big that cylinder has to be, Paris, oh, no. of just you and I swearing at each other and saying oh. like every other word. Oh, there's, That there's... Amish family is so glad they hauled this all the way down the track. Oh, uh, to be clear, I have nothing again. There's nothing wrong with the Amish. I just I know, from what I'm I, sorry, I just got to rib them because you know. uh, from what I know of their culture, um, I I don't think that this would make sense. Uh, I need to consult the internet. Maybe I this is I the rum springer. They they wasted the rum springer on book report. Club okay, and- this kid is like <laughs> seven and has a fake beard on. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Just to let you know. No, no, um, he doesn't. He doesn't. I'm sorry. I, okay. I imagined the fake beard. I, I take that <laughs> You, Paris. That was me. Um, um, all right. So after they have this weird book report club, the Tuttle family has a movie night where they watch a dystopian film. And that film causes Ethan and Emily to become pretty disturbed about the possibility of reality becoming as dystopian as the film. And I'm like, yeah, kids, I hear you. Um, <laughs> The kids then go to Fred's house and solicit his help in choosing a book from his library that will teach them to, quote, think really hard about how to make the future better. He then hands them Anatomy of the State by Murray Rothbard. Uh, Fred and then also the Tuttle parents help Ethan and Emily understand the text. The book ends with the twins feeling very hopeful about, quote, creating a future where people can choose for themselves. 
Yeah, it's pretty cut and dry. Kids read about a free market concept or at least a sort of anti-statist concept yeah. in a 30-page pamphlet. I, like, that's what this would qualify as, I suppose. Yeah, Anatomy of the State is, is, a, is 30 pages. Yeah. It's a, it's so a short, this book it's an is essay. larger. It's an the essay. Tuttle Twins book is longer. And, and yeah, a- well, the Tuttle, Tuttle Twins book includes a lot of pictures and it <laughs> explains things for children, so that's fine. <laughs> big, big, you know, big text. So Anatomy of the State is a worse book because it doesn't have pictures in it, is what I'm hearing. Objectively, it is worse because it doesn't have pictures. One just has words, another has pictures and words. So, I mean, who's really the the winner here? I, I don't know, Chris. Neither of us is the answer. Yeah, yeah, th- yeah, that's the answer, neither of us. Um So Paris, before we even start up here, can we just get the obvious riffs on Tuttle Twins out of the way? Yeah, I just kept reading it as Turtle Twins, and I, I know, uh, like... I, I'm, uh, I'm much more lewd, I suppose, and I just kept reading Tittle Twins. And, oh, the Titty, the titty Twins? Yeah, yeah, the Titty Twins. Yeah. Or perhaps even the Tutting Twins, a pair of butler children, who lament the sad state of affairs around here and all the work they have to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that, you know, they're trying to go with, like, cutesy, alliterative, easy, easily memorable uh, name, but yeah, maybe pick something that doesn't sound like titties or turtles, you know? You know what I think happened, Paris? What? There was, like, a rough draft on the first book that it was like, hmm, the blank, or, like, the title, I need a title, a twi- oh, the t- title, tw- the Tuttle Twins, the t- that's t- Yeah, the, t- the Tuttle Twins, yeah, great. Um, I mean, we're, the whole rest of this episode is gonna be me going on a fucking unhinged, caffeinated rant, so <laughs> let's just start with some- Paris Unleashed! Yeah, let's just start with, um, things that we liked about the book. So, um... Yeah, even, even, I mean, the main family is, you know, kind of your typical suburban white American couple, presumably. They at least pay lip service to other cultures right at the beginning. I mean, I'm not, like, thrilled at that, but it's more than I expected from the ads and website that I saw. Gotta say, the yeah. ads and the website made me think that this was going to be maybe borderline racist because, you know, it was just very, like, America, free choice. Everything I saw was white people, and I was like, "Uh oh, this might be bad." But you know, at least they're like, "Hey, hey, man, other people are not bad." I it mean, is, it's a real it low bar po- here, it, but it is totally possible to be a free market proponent and not be a bigot. There might be some things that you know sort of cross over there in terms of the consequences of the philosophy. Yeah, maybe. yeah. But it's totally possible to be like, yeah. In fact, there's a part, there's a line later in this book that I think really sets up my yeah. idea that the people y- that wrote this book are extremely multicultural and yeah. perhaps enjoy diversity. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that. Um, <laughs> there is like a, a kind of a tass a bit of like tacit racism. There's there's one illustration. Where uh, in the text below it, they mention an earlier book in the series with a character called Chief Ron. And this mention of Chief Ron is juxtaposed with two presumably native folks in stereotypical, like, plains native war dress fighting with shields and spears. And I was just like, oh, man, can we not do the whole, like, native people are stuck in the past thing? Like, ah, that was kind of a bummer. But, you know, we don't we don't have the context of knowing what that previous book was about, but... Just on its own, it just kind of gave me the uh oh <laughs> feeling. Yeah. Um, but you know, otherwise the illustrations were fine. You know, for a kids' book in a cartoon style, perfectly serviceable. Um, you know, nothing like Melanie's marvelous measles. You know, we're not yeah. encountering huge fruit and long elongated <laughs> faces. And, oh yeah. You know, this all looks. You know, it's it's cartoon. Pinkle Jinx, which was a little nightmarish in its own right at some <laughs> points. Yeah, this is fine. It's it's really simplistic, a really yeah. simplistic cartoon style, but it works for what they're doing. So yeah, the dude can draw know. people. Yeah, and a couple know. of simple backgrounds. Yeah, so fine. Um, there's no outright sexism or anything, but you know, like I said, there's kind of this underlying flavor of white Western patriarchy and the traditional American family. It's not. It's not like. In your face, but the the subtext is there. You know, there. You know, yeah. the family. The family's all white. They sit on their couch and watch a movie. They go bike riding in the suburbs while eating ice cream and shit. It's just real. You know, this is what life is supposed to be like. This is the ideal pinnacle of existence. 
Yeah. Is having two and a half kids with your heterosexual family in a <laughs> suburb in America. Uh, God forbid you try anything different. Well, yeah, I think I think the the reason that it is that way is because uh, a lot of people think, well, that's the average family, but it's not. <laughs> so I, I think, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I should say I'm pretty sure it's not. I mean, we're putting a lot of like assumptions on this right we now, are, right? We are, like, but like, you know, I'm. I'm just saying, I, when I was thinking about all the stuff we normally think about when we read a work, yeah. I was like, you know, this isn't this isn't the worst. It's it's okay. Yeah. Um, hey, you know what was great? There was no God or religion. That ruled. I was Despite, so relieved. I, I read in the back with the authors that they are they do come from Christian backgrounds. It seems yeah, like Yeah. And here's here's the weird thing is that um I read I so I didn't really mean to go digging for reviews but i happened to just see a couple and a few people left negative reviews about this series because they were like hey there's nothing on your website or in your promotional materials saying these books are religious but then there was references to god and religion in these and i really didn't want that for my kid and so i was expecting us to encounter that in this book but there's nothing in this book about that so that was good yeah God uh, can't I, mess with the free market. Uh, I'm I'm guessing that it must be in uh, in some of the other books that are that they do that are not um, retellings of of you know of existing works. Maybe sure. I don't know, but you know, hey, it wasn't in this one, so that's cool. I like that there was a glossary at the back that explained some of the terms. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a glossary that tells you what coercion is and dystopia, government, jurisdiction, etc. Yeah, so I think I think the thing I liked most about this book is that um, it engages kids on a, an important topic, you know, civics and government, and it does it in a way that doesn't feel patronizing. I, I really think authors should give kids and readers in general a bit more credit and expect a higher level of comprehension from them. And so I thought it was cool that this book did that. And by that token, I think it's like a decent children's version of the very basic concepts in the anatomy of the state although it doesn't really touch on everything but you know again it's for kids it's not yeah you know um so i think that yeah i i think that they the series seeks to give kids a little more credit give them things to think about that are important um for their actual lives so that's cool yeah from um, my like, yeah educator standpoint which admittedly i'm a music educator in a very specific instrumental field so not like my opinion there is like super above par or anything but i agree that young kids are pretty good at understanding more complicated concepts than you would think of especially around the tuttle twins age which is about nine or ten i think is where they're supposed to be yeah, I'm not, it's not clear, but I think you're right. And I do think that children should be engaged in basic civics or even political philosophy like this. At the minimum, just sort of asking the base level questions that give us these political philosophy discussions. Why not ask kids, what's the use of the state? Why do we need that? Or why should we have it? That's a perfectly reasonable question to get into with a child. Yeah, totally. I agree. Um, I, I And I think that... um. I think that a lot of <clears throat> children's children and youth media, you know, I'm talking, you know, below 18. I think a lot of it uh, doesn't try to actually engage kids in, in deep thought. So I appreciate that this series is at least trying, uh, even if I yeah, totally we, don't agree with it at all. We vehemently disagree <laughs> with the ideas in here, which we will get into. That's yeah. a kind of another thing. Oh, I, mean, I kind of also, from an educator perspective, I wish there was a little bit more discussion or activity recommendations. There is this one sample activity that happens in the book that is fine, but you could maybe add a little bit more on that standpoint. Well, there are some discussion. There are three discussion questions at the end, and <clears throat> there is. It says to visit tuttletwins.com slash future workbook to download the PDF of activities to okay, reinforce well, the lessons. I should shut up because that. Uh, no, because I went to the website and I got a 404 warning. Okay. <laughs> so- <laughs> well. 
<laughs> I guess that future workbook uh, scammed just, again. Parents. I guess. I guess. Uh, I don't know. I guess because we're living in a dystopia, the robots took it or something. There, um, like even in flashback, there was the there was a reading guide in the back, and that wasn't anywhere to be found. These people, no one's actually putting discussion <laughs> questions anywhere because no one's doing that, and they I, know it's not going to happen. I know. Um, it's just but, us, us sad yeah, it's, nerds. <laughs> Uh, us adults reading these, <laughs> these books. Um, there, so the three discussion questions printed at the very back of the book are, <clears throat> number one, is the existence of the state justified merely because people can vote for who controls it? Are we, are we about to have this discussion together? Or are you to- uh, I don't know. Do you want to? <laughs> I suppose that is the, the fundamental thing and difference between mass privatization or anarcho-capitalism as we get into or about to get into in that i suppose in one system you vote with a vote and in another system you vote with your resources which then inherently brings up the imbalance of resources that you have yeah which we're gonna which we're gonna talk about Um, (laughs) and thus if you have more money you have more vote power which messes things up a little bit yeah bit um all right number two what are some examples of significant challenges in our society and how could they be resolved without the state okay that i'm actually on board with <laughs> yeah. looks looks at police department um you <laughs> looks know at plague outside <laughs> yeah we're gonna talk about that plague don't you worry um three why are people often tempted to use coercion to get their way uh i mean that's pretty simple because people don't listen to reason so then you want to like Use your fists, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, words fail and you, and you gotta yeah. deck that idiot. Yeah, um, I mean, but coercion obviously uh, is is typically threats, not not physical violence. But anyway, um, so those are the three questions at the back. I don't know what happened to the rest of those discussion questions. They were sucked away by the evil <laughs> communists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the state. <laughs> um, yeah. No, right. you see, there, no, we have to find another children's book series that talks about free market ideals that does include discussion question or like more discussion questions and we we would vote with our dollars that way and then that's how you get the real competition (laughs) yeah are Um, there competing like kids free market there must be (laughs) what there must be competing free civics for kids or free market for the kids books out there you know, I, it didn't occur to me. I thought this was pretty a uh, pretty unique uh, concept, but maybe I was wrong. It's got to be a thing. Is this going to be like Pinkle Jinx, where we think that, uh, where I'm like, oh, surely this is the only birthday fairy book, and then I find that there's like 56 birthday fairy books by like 56 white suburban moms <laughs> in America. The um, Quaddle Quadruplets talk to you <laughs> <laughs> about why taxes are theft. Uh, yeah. Stacy's sect sufflets and the <laughs> evils of socialism. <laughs> oh. oh man. Um oh, yeah. Okay, so um, let's let's get to the the meat of this book here. Oh, Chris, did you have any other things you wanted to talk about that you liked about the book? Uh, I mean you covered most of the ground there. The illustrations are fine. It does not talk down to children, even though it clarifies things like phrases from Anatomy of the State that do have a lot of words to untangle, even for an adult brain, I would say. You might want to read that sentence again a couple times yep. to really get the idea. Um, and, yeah, I, I also like the not including God part here, which apparently was a problem in other books, as you told us, but at least in this one... Yeah. You know, give it a fair shake here. If you really want to be multicultural, don't, don't lean on that. Sorry, what? What? Um, you, you know, if you're including one religion, then, then that's sort of segregating out other people who might not follow that religion. So if you want to be all oh, multicultural oh. <coughs> and inclusive, it's I a see. good idea to not include that. Oh, yes, I do agree with you. Sorry, I don't know if I like if the audio cut out or something, but I totally missed the first part of that argument. I just heard you say... If you want to be multicultural, don't lean on that. And I was like, what? (laughs) Sorry. Don't lean on my anti-multicultural desk if you touch it. (laughs) You actually emit a magnetic field that repels all other cultures from you. Yes. Um, All right. So for anyone listening who is unfamiliar with uh, anarcho-capitalism and like libertarian concepts... 
this is just like a basic uh, definition of anarcho-capitalism, courtesy of Wikipedia. Anarcho-capitalism is a political philosophy and economic theory that advocates the elimination of centralized states in favor of self-ownership, private property, and free markets. In the absence of statute, anarcho-capitalists hold that society tends to contractually self-regulate and civilize through participation in the free market, which they describe as a voluntary society. Anarcho-capitalists support wage labor and believe that neither protection of person and property nor victim compensation requires a state. In a theoretical anarcho-capitalist society, the system of private property would not be enforced by the state, but by private defense agencies and insurance companies selected by consumers which would operate competitively in an open market and fulfill the roles of police and courts. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the, this entire book hinges upon four main concepts that are drawn from, you know, this definition of an anarcho-capitalism. Um, the one... The government is comparable to a business. Two, as a business analog, there should be competition between government types in the same country, which uh, the book tells us is polycentric law. Three, since even your government representation is now a business that you need to pay for service, everyone needs to be able to afford that. And four, most people often act with good intentions. I have problems with all yeah, of these things. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's just start hacking in here, Paris. Oh, because God. Yeah. So I just. Mm, mm. <laughs> First of all, if your business can print your own currency, that makes you pretty different. Oh, man. I didn't even think about that. That's the main thing Look I would you. say is that if your business can print its own currency, that sort of throws a whole lot of stuff out the window. You're not dealing with just raw debt to income ratio. You're oh, yeah, dealing hey. with a whole other set of things to, to that hey, render yeah. that not a useful train of thought. That's a great point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, like, who owns the creation and distribution of currency? Like, who is the Federal Reserve if there is no federal government? Well, the Federal Do Reserve each- actually isn't part of the federal government. It is a private entity. But... It is entangled you know I mean. and enmeshed it's, with yeah, the government. And- they don't just print money unless there's a lot of meetings first in the Senate. And well, yeah, and I'm saying like there's like uh, it's obviously controlled, you know, um, and it's the central form, the central currency. So I guess in this model, all the different states would have their own currency good god this yeah, is a fucking so nightmare <laughs> this is why i want to get to point number two very quickly point number one government is not a business i think is just immediately destroyed just by bringing that fact up of if you're I printing mean, I, your own fiat currency well i also just think that governments and business are are not as alike as a lot of people seem to think they are um sure governments provide services to people but they don't they don't have to be profitable like yeah. I, I, you know, we're not looking and, for a specific return on investment. You want the good of society is the return on the investment, right? And before anyone is like, but the national debt, like, oh god, the national debt is a myth. I don't even want to talk about like money at that extr- like money that is ephemeral and no one thinks about. Yeah, like, look, come on, <laughs> it's a it's a metric for something. But this is the again, if you're printing your own currency, it's not about whether you have enough money to pay off the debt. It's about whether all of the debt holders are going to try to call on that debt at the same time, which they won't because, they, I mean, something incredible has to happen for that to, to occur in the first place. I was going to say that, yeah, sure, national debt, countries have debts between them, but like, who, like, what is the UN going to arrest the US for not paying back its debt? Like, this isn't, you know, I just think, <coughs> excuse me, I just think that the, the whole specter of of debt and the nation being impoverished is um not as big of a th- like and the nation being affected by it I should say is not as big of a threat as a lot of people make it out to be. Yeah. Obviously we shouldn't be willy-nilly throwing money but I mean like we're already trillions of dollars in debt like, like it's not getting any better like we're not paying that off. <laughs> well, I mean secondly the other thing is I think it's healthier to think of the economy not as raw income in income out but as a measure of how much people are willing to trade resources. If resources are moving around and people are willing to trade things 
at reasonable values where that can continue going and thus, you know, more people are trading goods for services or cash or whatever, then that's a healthy society where everyone or most people will be able to obtain resources they need for survival. Yeah. If uh, things are stalled out and concentrated and held onto and hoarded, that is the sign of a bad economy. And that's, I think the national debt is supposed to be a somewhat bellwether for that because if a lot of people across all different industries have a lot of debt, then they're less willing to spend money on other things and thus things stall out, rendering the economy unstable. But the number itself isn't what you should be paying attention to. Well, we're talking, I'm, you're talking about private debts. So I'm talking about the national debt, like the federal government's deficit. Yeah, but even that is owed to some non-state entities. But yeah, most yeah. of the national debt is held by the government. Right. To itself. I, I just, yeah, I just think that, like, it doesn't actually matter as much as people try to make it seem. Um, so Money's anyway. I, it's all fake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, God, every existence isn't real. Yeah. Anyway, um I guess I got a little off topic there. My my whole point was just that the government doesn't operate as a business and whenever anyone tries to make the government into a business, it falls apart. Again, just gonna oh, I'm just gonna yeah. look out the window. Yep, still yeah. things still <laughs> falling apart out there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Everything's still on fire. Yep, still on fire. Literally in some places. Um <clears throat> All right, sorry. You had a you had another point. Oh uh, no, I just want I would like to go straight to point 2. Oh yeah. Um so the, in this this anarcho-capitalist system is saying that there should be competition between different types of government in the same country, which is polycentric <laughs> okay, law, yeah. which is something I you know, I've actually read the anatomy of the state years ago. Um but I didn't really grasp that polycentric well i guess i mean i understood that there were competing um governments but i never knew the the phrase polycentric law and i was like this sounds like the worst thing ever <laughs> mrs tuttle is totally down with polycentric law when mr tuttle brings it up mrs tuttle is all like oh polycentric i like the sound of that what's up in the tuttle house y'all chris you're really, like to mess you're really stretching you're really stretching there no, Mr. Tuttle's a cuck. You heard it here first, guys. Oh, Jesus. Wow. I don't Mr. know where Cuckle. you... Oh, you think she's with she's with Fred, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, they, he's they learned. He's got a big library. He, Fred's he helps, the bull. He's the knowledge the, bull. <laughs> he helps the kids understand stuff. You yeah. know, yeah. yeah What's totally. Mr. Tuttle doing? He's just being snarky at home all the time. Totally. <laughs> okay, I don't subscribe to that. Well, I mean, like, I... Just the whole cuck thing. I, all right, you know, I'm not going to go down this road. Continue. <laughs> we might just cut that joke entirely. No, 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 we're not. Oh, why not? Because I am in control. Uh, no. So anyway, besides Mrs. Tuttle, um, yeah, this idea that they propose of multiple competing governments on what I'm assuming is the same land mass? Is yeah, that what this is? The same, yeah, so within the same country. So, I mean, if you if you think about it, I mean, we, we have a... Similar-ish thing going on where states have laws that differ, um, and of course we have a federal government presiding over them. But um, in uh, this system, it would almost—I mean, you kind of—it kind of has to devolve into city states, right? Like, there's no other. I would assume, cause, yeah, because you're still limited by land. You have to say these rules apply in this physical space, because you can't have it be like. Oh, officer, you can't arrest me. I'm under the jurisdiction of the laws of Murderia, where uh, murder but... is cool and legal, <laughs> and so was the person that I was murdering. Oh, obviously, you can't ask them now, but I assure you that they were fine in, with being murdered because that's fine in Murderia. And then the yeah. officer goes, that's okay. I'm only under the jurisdiction of Pacifia anyway, so I can't even arrest you. Because I'm on the blue state team and you're on the green state team. And actually, in my under my laws, um, any form of arrest is considered coercion. So I really can't do anything, sir. So please go on your day and please don't murder me. Yeah, I'm just going to I just I need to persuade you not to murder me. So like, please don't <laughs> murder me because I make really good apple pie and I have a wife and kids. And, you know, I just think, you know, if you murder me. 
think about you know maybe someone will murder you because of that you know that's 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 not cool i suppose that um, that's what's supposed to hold together like anarcho-capitalist states like this either that or your private police force that is on call for you or perhaps just your handgun is supposed to be the solution no yeah no you're absolutely right there is no state or federal uh police or military it is only private services that you sign up for i'm <laughs> How I'm horrifying st- I'm is that? I'm still confused ah! about how... Listen, it, it can't be same land mass different laws yeah, and jurisdictions. Yeah, it is. It is. That... Mm, Paris, how does that work at all? It doesn't. There has never been a single That's society That's just sovereign that operates, citizens, just, right? That's just yes, people going, well, you is, can't do yep. that law because your flag has a gold fringe on it. And therefore, me, this person, is not a legal entity. And you can't charge me for a traffic ticket, your honor, sir. Dude, sovereign citizens totally come from this. If they don't, I'd be surprised. There's a there's a passage from uh, Rothbard. Uh, sorry, we're not talking about Tuttle Twins now. We're talking about the um, the text from which that book is derived. Um, it basically comes from John C. Calhoun's uh, theory. Fun to know. Um, just as the right of nullification for a state logically implies its right of secession... So a right of individual nullification would imply the right of any individual to secede from the state under which he lives. Sovereign citizen. (laughs) Yeah, there it is. There it is. So um, it's John C. Calhoun's fault that we have that theory. Um, Can blame him. He's been dead for a while now, but he sucked in a lot of ways. Now we have another thing to blame him for. (laughs) God damn you, Calhoun. And again, it's just like this whole theory is so fucking reductive and has and has this strangely extremely positive way of viewing humanity yeah it's so everyone's like, just gonna agree and no one's gonna try to get the nukes first and say well you all have to listen to me because i don't understand how under the system might makes right doesn't immediately happen because the one state where that is allowed just bullies everyone else yeah and that's and that's that's kind of what um a lot of other political theorists have have talked to how this ultimately kind of dissolve devolves into city states and that eventually there's always a monopoly on government because like you said one of them always kind of assumes more power in some way and takes over the rest um yeah, I just again, there's it, never so, been a document. So th- people have made arguments for um a couple of groups in history who have maybe operated like this, but I I read them all, all the ones I could find and I was like, no. As soon um, as you get to one person saying I don't have to follow the rules because they yeah. don't apply to me because I'm under a completely different jurisdiction, Everything just falls apart because then no one can agree on what is supposed to happen in this space. Yeah, I mean, and and like I said, we kind of have that problem with states, right, in the U.S. and the federal government and how different states have different laws and those sometimes are um, in disagreement with the feds. But the the whole solution to that is the judicial system. Well, normally, I think we live in a (laughs) different time now, Mm -hmm. which I'm going to make a case for in a second, but... um. You know, typically we have this check on things. You know, we have the judicial branch that's in, you know, should be able to um, arbitrate any issues and compare them to, you know, the Constitution and other founding documents about how this country is supposed to work and make a decision and then everyone follows it. But that's still um, rules, Paris. That's coercion. Exactly. It is. It is. Yeah. Right. It's coercion because there are consequences to something you do like. I'm sorry, man, but persuasion doesn't always work. And that's pretty clear. I'm not going to persuade someone from not murdering me like we just talked about. I'm not, you know, it's it's just... So unless gonna... you want to roll around with your own, like, war band at all times, which I suppose was... That's, like, the basic form of human societies, right? Why, like, why would we go back to that? Why is that better and freer because you have a choice? Well, it's better and freer because more people can get away with doing what they want because it is so chaotic and there are so many different ways that people can live. Um, I think that sucks because like like we just talked about, I think, or as you mentioned earlier, um, especially when you when you pair that shit with capitalism, it's real bad because then you have 
Um, which brings us to the third point I was talking about. Like, since since your your quote unquote government representation, um, i.e., your uh, defense and your judicial system, um, are now businesses that you need to pay for. If you can't afford that, then fuck you. Then you don't get protection. You don't get um, any uh, judicial benefits. And honestly, this we kind of have that problem now in this country with the judicial system. Um, where, I mean, it's maybe it's not all like private entities, but a lot of lawyers are private entities and we have to pay them just to go to court. And that shit sucks. Like, <laughs> I, I, for me, everything I recognize in our society that is some aspect of anarcho-capitalist theory are all the things I hate about our current society. <laughs> it, it, it's really just coming down to might makes right again, or resource might even makes right in the case of capitalism. If you have the most resources, you can basically control what people do. Or at least, you know, have more influence on the things around you. And I don't see how, just because you have more choices, that's not automatically better. And just because something is profitable doesn't automatically mean it's beneficial to the greater good of everyone around you. Yeah, I I totally agree. And so, and so, all right. So, yeah, I just think that, I mean, in the U.S., and again, sorry, we're using the U.S. because we've both lived here. Our most, mm, I lived here my whole life. Chris, you most yes. of your life? Yes. Yeah. I've been here the um, entire time. Okay. <laughs> Chris went back to his home planet. Um, yeah. In the U.S. No, if I we, could right now, I would, Paris. Believe me, if I had that ripcord we, to pull. <laughs> we already have so many issues because things have become privatized. I mean, look at the controversy with the post office right now. It's not, it hasn't even been, but it's like on the verge of being so, and it's already getting fucked because of because of ideas from the private sector from business yeah and And the big i mean i'll let you finish your thought actually sorry yeah and 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 like look at healthcare. Healthcare is privatized in this country and it's a fucking disaster and i just i can't imagine a world where everything was that way i mean don't get me wrong like we have a lot of problems in the u.s and i especially now but again I feel as though we have we slide closer and closer to an anarcho capitalist world, and as we do so, it is worse and worse for the people who live here. I mean, yeah, let's just tease out the idea of some of the like different industries being privatized. First of all, right with the post office, US I mean UPS and FedEx won't deliver to super rural areas because it's not profitable. So who do they rely on to do some last mile deliveries in non urban settings? A lot of the time, USPS, the postal service who does not generally run a profit on that kind of stuff. And that's just that industry. Let's go to healthcare. You can already see, I don't understand. I never understood the whole death panels thing when that's just what an insurance company is. Why? Yeah, an insurance company already does that. Yeah. So uh, immediately I can just point to that and see how I don't know anyone who is ecstatic about having to pay for insurance like that except people that have never had to use it. And it's a low cost. Yep. Thirdly, law enforcement. So this book directly proposes that people should be able to pay competing police forces in their area for their service. Now, First of all, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm assuming not all of them are connected to an easily reachable and dialable emergency line, right? They would all have their own lengthy phone numbers, which immediately is one thing to sort of, uh, you know, throw a wrench in the works there. Well, Secondly, I don't know. I'm sure that I'm sure that they could. Oh, you're right. Yeah, there's only so many numbers on a, in the fucking system. Yeah, I don't know. Secondly, then, so you call your police force of choice, or if there's, what if there's is some kind of, you know, shoot active shooter or a terrorist attack or something, you know, someone that is violent. Do all of the police forces rush to the scene and try to take care of it first? And on one side, you have all the pacifist social workers trying to de-escalate things, but meanwhile, the super uber. Uh, Oorah crew of police officers is going in there with like AK 47s blazing or AR 15s, I suppose, in America. Oh, yeah. And then, like, and then, you know, the, the other more fun scenario is like, 
I'm having a disagreement with my landlord, so I call my private private military, and he calls his, and then what? They kill each other over it, and whoever lives wins the <laughs> argument. Like, oh no! But wait, work? my landlord is under the jurisdiction of landlordia, and I am under the jurisdictions <laughs> of fuck you. I don't have to pay shit. <laughs> so yeah, at that point, you're just at roving bandit games again, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, th- how does that not turn into this? We're just—it's just Mad Max. It's fine. Exactly. It's fine. Just, it always it, like, it, again, it, unless you have some kind of way. You know what, Chris? I get get on the front of that crazy desert vehicle. I got to strap yeah, I'm the you Duke in. Warrior, right? You got some. You got some guitar to play. Get to it. I su- you know, I suppose if we're going to end up there, I wouldn't mind that gig. At least yeah. my skill. I've I've cultivated these skills for so long. It's either that or like barred for food. Yeah, I just wouldn't want to get stuck in that awful harem, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Anyway, so th- I mean, immediately, I just don't understand why privatization and choice is automatically better, especially in situations where it's much better to not have a profit motive for things, where the end goal should be: Did we deliver good service? Yeah, um, I have a big question right now. Mm-hmm. How the fuck is a capitalist system not inherently coercive? It is. <laughs> if you have to have currency and wealth to engage in society, you're being forced by the dollar to subscribe to that system. So it's total bullshit to say that capitalism isn't a coercive system. It absolutely is. Uh there is no art. There is no way out of that. I suppose the idea is that because you can choose with your dollars, which I suppose again, if you have competing states in the same area, whether you have murderia dollars or fucking, you know, landlordia dollars, that's going to be a <laughs> whole nother wrench in the works. Because you know, murderia and landlordia don't really accept currency from each other because the landlords don't really like being murdered all the time, so they don't accept the blood money. So immediately, like, again, right there, but, but yeah. I suppose, again, my point would be that because you have the ability to choose with your money, that is better in all respects. Because as long as you have the ability to make a choice about who protects you, that's always better. <sighs> it's not, though. I, I would say the guarantee of security and justice is always going to be better than being able to choose. And this gets back to being able to elect officials. Mm-hmm. Because in a business, if you can only elect your dollars, then you're also limited by what people are running startups around here for you to patronize. By the way, let's go on to the other tangent of what does a startup police force look like? It's like three dudes with a couple of BB guns and two pairs of handcuffs between them. And they're just trying to get their shit ready. So they're just scouting out all the possible crime scenes and just waiting for someone to call on them first. Because they got to, we're the budget cops. We're only 50 bucks an arrest. Yeah, it, oh, man, it's such a fucking sad thing to think about. And it makes, and and like I said, I feel as though we're kind of already there in a lot of ways. Um, Because even though, even though we have, uh, you know, police that are theoretically run by a city or state, these police unions that uh, kind of, are really the thing that run them and they're they're not like a regular union they're kind of like a mob they're kind of exactly like this <laughs> so uh yeah just i suppose the reasoning there is move to a city with a better police force if we're following this idea or you know disband defund the police paris and yep. create different private yep. police organizations <laughs> instead no. So, let it be no. said here first, author of the Tuttle Twin subscribes to defund the police. <laughs> Actually, they do, because they yeah. they see taxation as theft. Yeah. That's a major theme in this book. Um, I, I, libertarian and free market ideology should probably support defunding the police. Yeah, it actually should. So... Yeah, so by their model, um, any there should be no forcible taxes. There should only be... Um, things you sign up for <laughs> so chris if you want to talk pic- about the drawing yeah this is one of my favorite pictures in, in, in the book because the, it's presented as there's a little you know checklist where you can check off what services it's a service options you want to pay for um and my favorite things are that there's some stuff that is reasonably checked off like um life insurance i think is one uh, which, li- life protection life property protection, protection property universal protection. road access okay but uh, not but- checked off directly <laughs> under that not checked off under that is education 
and complete medical care. Fuck that shit. I want to pay for my big private military gang. I don't need to learn nothing when I've got my boys with me. And they're oh, you know what? Okay, so they didn't check off education or complete medical care, but you know what they did check? What did they check, Paris? Uh, wildlife preserve and football stadium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super important. Yes. I mean, uh, immediately, of course, we can see where this is a bad idea in some respects, right? Because if we're only partially funding education with people who want to go to school, that kind of fucks things up a little bit, I would say. Yeah, yeah and I think and I think it's very attractive. Um, it's a very attractive ideology for people on the surface because they're like, yeah, I don't want to pay for things I don't use because, you know, when you're managing your own finances, that's often a concern you have. But when it comes to society... Uh, like newsflash assholes you don't live in a fucking vacuum nobody does we all live in a goddamn society together whether we like it or not you have to interact with other human beings it is a function of being alive in existence and you cannot divorce yourself from having to deal with the groups of people and what broad rules we would all like to follow you just can't yeah um so anyway i get why people because people think like oh yeah if i'm not if i'm not using it i shouldn't have to pay for it but like you're saying, unfortunately, um, th- that leads to far greater problems because it, it, just because people feel like they don't use roads enough doesn't mean that their perception of that is actually true. You know, uh, like, yeah, oh, yeah, I don't want to pay have for perfect roads. Information. Yes, which is a which is a big pro- which is, I guess, brings us to is that the fourth problem? Yeah. The fourth um, issue that we have with this whole thing is that it assumes that most people often or always act with good intentions and or even rationality we can even yeah you know. with rationality and also as you pointed out very importantly it also assumes with that that so it assumes people have good intentions they act on those good intentions and that they have enough information to make a good decision and i know i if know you it's left, not if true if you didn't That's check off true. education on that services list i got some bad news for you buddy <laughs> Um, you didn't so, learn your fractions, and now you feel ripped off because you didn't understand that one third was bigger than one fourth. I mean, yeah, and I, I, um, I understand why people might hear us say that and say, "Oh, you're being so pessimistic. People are inherently good. There's good in all of us." Yeah, sure, but unfortunately, not everybody has the right has the right or enough information to make some decisions. Um, like I said about roads, for example, you know, if if all of us non car havers are like, like well, me, I've never yeah. driven a car in my entire life. Yeah, you'd be like, no, I don't, I don't want to fund roads, and then, you know, maybe roads. I'm like, maybe I'm like, eh, I don't want to fund roads either, and maybe we think, you know what, you know what needs, you know what, that football stadium needs my money more than the roads, so that's oh, where I'm shit. putting. How my do money. I get to the football stadium? There's no <laughs> roads. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fuck. How oh, no the football play- Oh no, the football players blew up because the road <laughs> fell apart when they got- <laughs> They fell into a ditch and died. <laughs> yeah, and I guess I guess what I'm saying is that um there's nothing wrong with having basic needs served by a government entity and I I I don't or at know least why. by pooling the resources cuz we yeah. can immediately point to health insurance. How does insurance work? People pay in, so there's a pool of money to pay out to people who need it. The fact that we've fractioned it all off into separate pools all the time means that those pools have to be more tightly managed than if you just threw it all in one pool. And we could probably cover more claims that way because there would be less inefficiency of paperwork that has to be moved around. Of oh, am I in network with this doctor? Is you know we have to pay the administrative over here. Uh, you know we have to hire five of them instead of just a handful to handle this data, and so on and so forth. From there, I'm not going to get into that, but that's just one clear example of how pooling resources in one pool can be more beneficial than having all of your pools as different choices. Yeah, and then here's my here's my greatest question of all. Um, it just well, let me say something else first. Um. This whole model, it gets to the heart, you know, in the in the book and in Anatomy of the State, it gets to the heart of the whole anarcho-capitalist libertarian ideas of human life, that ultimately not everyone deserves it, and life has to be a struggle to gain wealth, to therefore hold more power than other people. And what kind of model is that for a society? For me, it just seems so anti 
human and anti-life. And I know that's not how it's painted in the book. And I I want to believe that the people who um who cling to this don't want don't think that. But that is ultimately what it leads to, because it leads to a great imbalance of of finances and, and resources. Um and a, a, yeah, like a de evolution into warring city states. It's just it just doesn't uh to me, I, I can't imagine this actually functioning in a real society in the modern day for a large group of people you know maybe if you had your little 20 person commune or whatever like i don't know maybe it'd work (laughs) yeah in a small area sure but when you expand it to billions and billions of people there's going to be some rough patches here and there to deal with yeah it just seems like you know like where is justice who arbitrates between paramilitary forces? Oh, right, Law- lawyers and judges that you also have to hire, and and then and then like we already talked about, who then arbitrates between those states? I, I just there's it's just radical chaos that couldn't possibly be stable for a very long time, especially in a country this size. I do think that, I don't know if I'm butting in on your thought here, but when you talk about different states here, they do briefly, you know, with the whole, we should be able to choose which government we're under jurisdiction of. Isn't that an advocation for free immigration? Oh, yeah, that's right. You did bring this up with the multicultural thing. Um, Isn't isn't that saying that I should be allowed to choose whatever state I want to live under at will, freely? Yeah, it it surely does. It sure does. I, I'm going to agree with you there. That I think, must be I think what this the, is o- what the tr- open borders. Open yeah. borders. This this must be what this, this this set of authors or author and illustrator are advocating for, right? I can't think of it any other way. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not really sure how you could have a system like this that didn't have open borders. Oh, you know what? You know what they would know. There would be a cost, probably. Yeah, you got to pay your way in. Landlord, you have to have yeah. enough resources. So once again, yeah. you're just coerced, right? Yeah. Right in the end. Mm-hmm. You're still some. You have to there's, listen yeah. to someone. There's rules that someone is imposing upon you. Yeah, and so and so again, you know, like I was saying, how how kind of dismal or how um sort of anti-human this is. Uh, wh- you know, why would we not just seek the best situation for the most people possible as a society? Wh- why then, is that not the thing we're seeking? Because then you're giving handouts, and if you have if you have to. If you don't have to work for something, it's you won't value it, and you must suffer to earn a good life. Oh yeah, and if and if I have three choices instead of five, my human liberty has been thrown out the window. <laughs> so um, something that I realized, well, I, I think I've already mentioned this twice now. How I felt that as I was rereading Anatomy of the State and reading the Tuttle Twins book and thinking about these things, it made me feel. It made me realize that I think the U.S. is slipping into this under under this current administration. And and um, I think there's no greater example than how we are currently dealing with covid in the United States. Mm-hmm. It is extremely anarcho capitalist and it is going extremely poorly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we're just, number one. We're number uh, one. America first. Bear with me here. So. <clears throat> In America, we all have separate separate states under a federal government. Each state was allowed to handle COVID as they saw fit. Those state actors, like governors and mayors, acted in what they thought was the best interest of their constituents, but was not allied what was not allied with science or reality. This led to increased spread and no real end in sight for the current situation. Any treatments and cures um, are being created by private entities and will likely be sold rather than distributed freely. Uh, medical supplies and treatment, and of course health care, are not handled in a centralized way and is all privatized, leading to yet more chaos. I mean, to me, the anarcho-capitalist model is how we have handled COVID, and it has led to widespread economic downfall, death, illness, and an overall broken citizenry. I mean, if we had a strong federal response that allied itself with science, the U.S. would be so much better off right now. And I don't, to be clear, it's not like I'm sitting here saying, you know, we have to be communist or, or, you know, or I really love a strong federal government. Like, I don't I don't love the idea of a strong federal government. But this is this is one of those kind of once in a lifetime emergencies where, you know, you have a fucking super deadly pandemic. It's time to have 
one group with all the scientific information making the right choices. And we didn't do that. (laughs) And so to me, I don't know, I was just thinking about that. And I was like, yeah, fuck this whole theory. It sucks. Oh, and then something the, the Tuttle Twins book doesn't talk about, but Anatomy of the State does. Anatomy of the State, um, it, it um, ha- definitely puts forth the uh, denigration of experts. And it says that um, intellectuals are allied with the state because intellectuals help prop up the state in its power. And scientists are included in that. Um, there's some disparaging things said about science that I took some notes on. Um, in Anatomy of the State, Rothbard says that illegitimate rulers, they rule by divine right and are the aristocracy of men or the scientific experts. Like, fuck you, equivocating scientific experts with divine right? Like, get the fuck out of here. Wait, Those are there, not the same. Has there ever been, like, a science-led purely science-led civilization out there that was like the tyranny of the scientists <laughs> well no but but these ideas are this is this kind of thinking is like we're living with the fallout of this kind of thinking right now absolutely um and it really surprised me because i remember when i read anatomy of the state i didn't remember this this part like the latter half or wherever or maybe this isn't even in the latter half i just didn't remember this particular aspect of it um and this whole idea that intellectuals, quote unquote, are in league with the state at all times doesn't make super make sense to me. <laughs> that's, I, literally, that's literally a conservative forum post right now, Paris. You just read a 30 page conservative forum post. Well, it's because I, I think they must worship anatomy of the state. I don't know. It's weird because I don't, I don't really ever hear anyone talk about Rothbard, but I certainly hear these ideas every single day now. Because they're not actually reading these like primary sources. It's just it got parroted through four different people until it turned into what it is here. It's all Rand Paul's fault. Um. <laughs> <laughs> just him. Just him. Uh, no, but uh, I, you know, and it's and it's not like I want to throw out the whole thing. Rothbard also says other things that I do agree with that I think are valid. And and again, I, I want to point out that I think it is right to question, right? I think it's okay for you to think critically about something and write a short paper like this and be like, hey, we should think about this stuff. That's fine. But to read this and take it as fucking gospel without ever having actually applied it anywhere, what are you doing? (laughs) Like, that that doesn't make sense. Don't do that. Seems like, you know, the type of person that would take this as gospel wanted a reason to be like, no, officer, you can't charge me for this robbery because... Of the gold fringe on my flag. Uh, God. I am not under your jurisdiction. All right. Uh, well, Paris. I I'm mean, exhausted. For, I'm exhausted. Yeah. The, I, I think the fundamental disconnect for me in terms of my philosophy, which, you know, isn't. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I really thought. All of our philosophies are just sort of a, a melange of our experiences, biases, and, you know, best guesses at what we think should happen. And I think the fundamental disconnect between me and people that put forth this kind of thought is that they're valuing pure choice as the true freedom. So my ability to choose between the best insurance company is freedom. I would argue that true freedom is not having to worry about that shit at all and just having my health care automatically be taken care of in a way that doesn't cost me my own personal resources besides the tax that I put in along with other people. And thus, because everyone is in on it, it's a lower share that I have to put forth and I don't have to worry about it as much. Therefore, I am free to pursue other things with my brain instead of worrying about, Hey, how am I going to pay for this dialysis? Yeah. I gotta say, I, um, I gotta say, I agree with you. Um, I really think that life um, like you said, life doesn't have to be about suffering. Um, I'm not saying that all suffering is avoidable or that suffering doesn't help you appreciate things because I think it can. Uh, but hard work, I do value hard yeah, work as a guitar wait, teacher. Course. I understand the value of not going for instant gratification and sitting down and putting the time into something. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I I think that uh, yeah, there's something to be said for putting. Uh, effort into something and and feeling value in in your labor um, and your struggle, but I I just think that these ideas are then kind of blown out of proportion, and 
it's, you know, it turns into the situation like we've already described where everything becomes suffering and everything becomes hard work and there is only value in things if they require those. Whereas um, it's perfectly reasonable to just exist and do things you like, right? Um, yeah. There is no one way to live. Um and I, yeah, I don't know. I And I think it, it may, kind of like our last episode, I think it's particularly hard for us to read this stuff right now because I'm going to say it a fourth time, it really feels like this is what the United States is becoming. <laughs> I'm going to have to pledge my um, undying fealty to Disney soon because they're going to own all the performing arts when everything else <laughs> comes crashing down. Well, I'll just be in the roving Disney tour van as guitar player number 7,457B. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess, you know what, though? If if we do if we do devolve into anarcho capitalism and we become the free New England Republic, I'm actually kind of fine with that because <laughs> yeah, we, we we've say. got some all right we've got some all right laws up here. It's not you the know, best. You know, like like Luke, right. Pennsylvania and New York in there a little bit, and we'd probably be fine. Yeah, the the upper right hand corner of the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> you know, upper right area. Is upper, what yeah, we call it. it's. Uh, it's yeah, I don't know. Dude guy ked. Yeah, yeah dude, dude guy ked. Um, Dunkin' Donuts, yeah. Dunkin the dunks. <laughs> the dunk, yeah. You are now entering the dunks. In order to have transactions in the dunks, you must. Please exchange all southern state currency for Dunkin' Donuts bonus points. <laughs> We trade exclusively in iced coffees and munchkins. <laughs> you don't have those. You, you're, not, you're not getting anything in here. Yeah, that's it. Doesn't matter if it's December. It's still iced I coffee. Bought house, <laughs> I bought a house with 17,000 tons of Dunkin's iced coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's just like the, the bar by which we measure things. <laughs> yeah, because that's what keeps society going. Because you drink the coffee in the morning to get you, you be able to do the labor. Chris, America runs on Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> We've done it. We've come full circle. Now I'm thinking of what else. What else would be part of the dunks? Um, what what other? Um, oh, the the sports teams. I mean, we have all the sports teams, right? I've been told. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah how would you have wait how would you oh god I just yeah my elbow is <laughs> so hard on the boom You're too excited ah! about this idea what, what's the idea what, what was worth uh, your elbow pain Paris? Uh, oh only through the suffering can I understand how good my joke is uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not even a good joke I was gonna say oh yeah sports would be some some real high high level events you know you'd have all these security services Escorting the sports teams, but from you know, from from the Mid Atlantic to the Dunks, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be a big thing, you know, crossing state lines. Yeah, um, I would actually connecting this. Like, wouldn't going back to the rival police firms or whatever that you have to pay for? Wouldn't you know some of them would have like some dumbass names like Tiger Claw Security and shit like that? Oh my god! Yeah, oh. <laughs> the fucking like teams of police that ha- would have all tough guy names and shit. Oh my god! It was, oh man, I'm thinking all the Boston ones would be terrible. <laughs> uh. Muscle dudes security. <laughs> The s- Sully and Pat's the South- security the force. The Southie Clovis. <laughs> oh, fuck me. Oh, this is truly a hell world, and we're actually living in it. I actually feel like we have adopted so many of these policies. I mean, honestly, at the end of it, it turns into flashback, the last book we read. Oh, right, Jesus. I mean, th- you're right. That's ah! what you want, right? That's what you want, right? Oh, you're right. All right, Paris. Uh... Do you have anything else to say? I think, um, in addition to screaming, I think I'm going to end this with some words from Chomsky. Um, because I like, I liked what he said about how this sucks. Um, <clears throat> anarcho-capitalism, in my opinion, is a doctrinal system which, if ever implemented, would lead to forms of tyranny and oppression that have few counterparts in human history. There isn't the slightest possibility that it's in my view, horrendous ideas would be implemented because they would quickly destroy any society that made this colossal error. 
The idea of free contract between the potentate and his starving subject is a sick joke, perhaps worth some moments in an academic seminar exploring the consequences of, in my view, absurd ideas, but nowhere else. Um, and yeah, again, United States, please stop doing this. Don't fall into this because it's happening. God, I feel like so many things that Trump has done and is trying to do, like in his administration, is just pushing us this way. You know, like like when, uh, I mean, even the judicial system has been fucking up with this shit, you know? Unequal fucking decisions and, uh, I'm ranting now. Paris, <sighs> can we fix it? Yeah, and not by, society. I mean, this book. Yeah, by seceding to the dunks. <laughs> yeah, Let's go. We started here first, people. This is where the revolution starts. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> Watch me. I would have an FBI agent pop up in my house. Like, um, did you post a podcast? Oh, fuck me. Advocating for secession into a state known as the dunks, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, this is the episode that's going to get us uh, fucking kidnapped and stuffed in a trunk, huh? Um, FBI, open up! Well, can we fix the book? All right, so back to the, back to the actual the, the Tuttle Twins book and not Anatomy of the State. So, uh, for the Tuttle Twins, again, I, I appreciate the ideas of, you know, protecting your individual liberty and choice for some stuff and restraining the state from total control over all things. But I, I just think the system takes those, both of those ideas way too far. Um, individual liberty is a balance. You can't simply have a system where people are allowed to do whatever the fuck they want all the fucking time in terms of, you know, businesses and legal stuff, because largely people can't be trusted on a large scale to have the best intentions or all the information they need to make the best decisions. And again, we don't all live in a vacuum. Um, I did like that the book didn't have any God stuff. And um, all that being said, I don't think it's terrible to give your kids a Tuttle Twins book as long as you're also exposing them to like Hobbes for babies or democratic socialism for dummies or something too. <laughs> you know, because if you respect free choice, then you should extend that to your kids. That's what I was going to say. The only way I would fix this is maybe at not making it a thing where we're talking about these ideas are the ones we're advocating, this one philosopher Perhaps having a broader discussion about ways to think about the state and the benefits and negatives of having an overarching monopoly in this way that we vote for would be a much better way to present a children's book. So that way the child can think for themselves about it and perhaps arrive at their own conclusion instead of just being said, hey, you shouldn't force people to pay taxes because that's coercion and that's bullying and that's bad. Perhaps outline the things that taxes have benefited us with. Yeah. And allow allow a discussion to take place about civics instead of... Honestly, we know that they're trying to go for one ideology here. Yeah, um, if you go to TuttleTwins.com and, you know, you start looking at the book titles, you're like, oh, you know, this, this doesn't seem so bad. You know, there's... Um, hmm. Tuttle Twins and the Miraculous Pencil. The Tuttle Twins and the Food Truck Fiasco. Or... Or the teen books, you know, the Tuttle Twins and the Little Pink House. Hmm, okay. And then, you know, if you go all the way to the bottom and you look at their PDFs, there's one called Subtle Ways Your Kids Are Taught to Embrace Socialism. There are, <laughs> okay. there are many subtle ways that socialist ideas are being introduced, taught, and reinforced directly to your children. Our ebook walks through several examples to help raise your attention to this agenda so you can help your children avoid being indoctrinated to support the state. I fucking guarantee you in there it's like when you when when children are taught to share that socialism I bet I bet, I actually I, for, I meant to da- to get that PDF for us and I forgot so my bad but uh yeah so I I do think that's a little insidious <laughs> um like like you know but that's not part of this book so um again it's fine if this is included in your child's reading reper- repertoire as long as there are other ideas as well um yeah, I, I like I said, I, I want to believe these guys are acting in good faith, but that uh, that PDF against socialist stuff kind of uh, makes me think otherwise. So, yeah, uh, that's that's honestly where I'll leave this, Paris. You don't have any other comments? Nope. That that's it. I ranted enough, and I think you did too. Oh, uh, so much ranting. Um, all right. Well, in that case, uh, I promise you. We will not be doing anything political for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, um, as, as far as we know for the schedule, um, we've got actually two more patrons' choice episodes coming up. 
Wowee. People getting their stuff in late this year. Well, good. I mean, I've been harassing them on yes, every show. Exactly. For Thank months. you. I'm not I'm not bitching. Don't get me wrong. No, I'm I'm super glad. I love reading stuff for patrons because it's it's just always just wildly bizarre every time um so thank you speaking of patrons thank you to our patrons thank you to dari greg will veronica d lynn Sinya, yakub bobby black cat jensina mayo cat elliot kieran martin jay and amy if you too would like to join our illustrious list of names and help support the show you can don't don't do that do that uh, <laughs> suddenly Dutch ah uh, you you can do that oh I was gonna say it in Norwegian I actually don't know the word for donate in Norwegian do so. <laughs> your money hang on please hold <laughs> my mouth just fell apart that was amazing I've never had that oh it's donare okay <laughs> That can't be right. I don't know why that's funny right it's now. It's very funny. That can't be... Donere? That doesn't even sound like a Norwegian word. Donere. Like, well, that sounds like an Italian <laughs> word. Donere. <laughs> that can't be right. Paris double second. checks to make sure <laughs> the translator is right. The podcast. It just sounds so fucking dumb. It just sounds so fucking wrong. Okay, Paris, I think How we need to finish really? thinking. Okay. All right. If you also want to help support the show and join our illustrious list of names, you can donate $1, $5, or $10 a month, or whatever you choose to us on Patreon for various rewards. You can subscribe or follow the show on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or on Goodreads. You can also share the show, tell some people about it. That's free. Um, or you can rate and review us on whatever podcast platform you choose, whether that is Podbean, Podchaser, iTunes, Radio Public, whatever. Uh, if you want to contact us directly, you can send us a message on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Goodreads, or you can send an email to us at terriblebookclub at gmail.com. Uh, with that, we uh, we close and we we wish you a lovely start to yeah, the autumn. Yeah, we felt a couple of days of that hemisphere. over here, and I was so ready for it. I want more of that crisp, cool evening air. Oh, uh, dude, me too. I'm so psyched. I'm going to have a pretty sick porch to enjoy that on nice. in uh, about, a, about a week, so... Let's, All let's right, hope Paris. For that. I suppose this is goodbye. Uh, well, Chris, <laughs> I'll Bye, see Paris. you in the dunks. Hail dunks. Bye. <laughs>